Yeah, the appointed hour has arrived. So uh, we'll get the meeting going. I see there's still people coming in the back. There are a few chairs um, scattered throughout, but it, we have the happy problem of probably not having enough seats for everybody who's, who's come in. That's, that's good. So let me uh, start the official kickoff. They have a, a thing for us to read here. Um, last year I tried just winging it, and I screwed it up every time. As a member of the EC, I get to listen to all the recordings of these things, and it's embarrassing listening to yourself sometimes. Uh, good morning and welcome to the 40th Colorado Ab Convention in Cary, North Carolina. Uh, today is Monday, the 25th of March, and uh, this is the session titled Different But Not Destructive. And we'll say a few words about what that means in a moment. Uh, my name is Barry Clasper. I'm the moderator for the session uh, and also one of the panelists. And uh, my panelist is my, uh, my friend, Eric Henderlaw, who I've had the privilege of working with on the uh, on the board for the last couple of years, um, I'll let him give you his uh, calling background and, and history. Um, but he's been calling a good number of years. He does everything uh, from party nights to uh, C1. I think you're uh, starting a C1 group. You said you're hoping to start a C1 group. So he's got a lot of good calling experience. Uh, let me just give you a little background on the title different but not destructive. These kinds of sessions in the past have been titled things like creative choreography. Um, nobody's really sure what that means. Um, different but not difficult, which is a lie, because we all know that if something is different, it automatically carries at least some level of difficulty. That's one of the major elements of difficulty, is that it's unfamiliar. Um, so Eric and I got talking in a meeting that we were in and realized that we had sort of similar lines of thought on this um, and we came up with the title different but not destructive meaning you can do something that the dancers have either not seen before or don't see very often without necessarily making it a, a bizarre horrible earth-shaking experience for them it can be something where they they go oh that was different and that's kind of what we're what we're shooting at here. So without any further ado, I'd uh, like to turn it over to my colleague, Eric. And uh, do you want me to pass these handouts out or do you want to wait until the end? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. All right. Is this on? No, there it is. Good morning. Guys, you're all here. I'm uh, Eric Hennerlaw. I live in the suburbs outside of San Francisco. So I'm the West Coast representation here. Um, I've been calling 32 years, 33 years, something like that. Um, I call all levels, like I say, I do a lot of beginner nights, party nights, I have plus groups, advanced groups, and C1 groups as well. Um, this session is, as Barry would kind of alluded to, is, is kind of talking about how we can take what we have and, and kind of look at it a little differently in, in the calls we already have without having to go into something different, without having to go into more calls, and make it so that it could be interesting and different, something different than what we've been thinking about, without having to make it incredibly... Um, destructive, uh, challenging, perhaps. Are you using? Uh, is, somebody coming? is somebody coming in from the speaker? Is somebody coming in from this speaker here? Is that is that wireless turned off? Uh, Mic's turned off. Okay, levels. Hello, hello. Yeah, that. Okay. Let's so bring up another signal. So the thought process on this is that callers after they've been calling for a while, kind of get into a routine where they call the same patterns and figures. And, and I'm going to focus this right now on the mainstream program. I'm not going to go above mainstream. Is that okay? So we just talk about mainstream and below. Um, everything, one through mainstream. So callers get into patterns and figures where they call the same things over and over again because, because that's the way they were taught. Maybe that's the way they learned. Maybe that's the way they grew up with the calls. And certain patterns always flow together. And, and for good reason. A lot of them work well. They flow well together. <laughs> So, so the idea here is to think about the calls we use, um, already we use, we already know the calls. I'm, I'm assuming that everybody here calls at least through the mainstream program. And to use the calls we have in ways that might be a little different than we thought about. Now, a lot of you probably, I could be preaching. Sure. I'm going to take the wireless mic. 
I'll switch the wireless mic on this. Okay. So a lot of you probably, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir because maybe a lot of you already use mainstream program creatively in a lot of different ways. And so if that's the case, I hope that you can add your input into this session as well. But the idea here is to stimulate some thought in about what we do with the current programs we have without having to add more calls or get into extensions of calls that become questionable. Everybody knows what I mean by that. You know, somebody says, hey, we can do this call this way, and you kind of think, eh, I'm not so sure. You know, I mean, not, that, not that somebody hasn't done it, but I'm not really sure that's how the call is supposed to be done. But there's a lot of ways that calls can be done without having to go into gray areas of interpretation. Several years ago at Nationals, I saw uh, Tony Oxendine do a session, which is a wonderful session, which kind of, kind of led me into this one, which was, again, different but not difficult. And he, he did a lot of stuff with stars and, 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 and motions and circles that we don't really use a lot of in the mainstream program. And they were good, they were flowing, and they were just enough different in it from what we normally do every day to make it interesting for dancers and for callers, too. Because on the other side of that, you have to do a little more work and pay attention because it's very easy to fall into the semi-conscious pattern of calling the same calls and routines rather than consciously thinking, okay, I could do it differently. I could do it this way. But how do I do that to make it a little different without making it awkward or, or jerky or unflowing? How can I do that? How can I make the calls a little different to give the dancers a little something? Oh, that was kind of interesting without killing the dancers. Nobody wants to be killed. The dancers don't want to be killed. They want to be... Have fun. They want to have it be challenged to the point where it's interesting, not where it's going to kill them. Okay, so that's kind of the, the basis of the session. So we have some ideas here. Barry and I are going to talk about them. But we also want to encourage your input, and I'm sure a lot of you have some good input on this, and what you do to make, and we'll just kind of focus on the mainstream program for right now. I don't know what Barry's going to do, but I'm going to focus on mainstream. What you do to make things a little different and, and to give your dancers a little spice without killing them at the same time. So does that sound okay? All right. So to start out with this, this you want to see? Okay. If you have any comments, please put them on the microphone. And if you have ideas about something in choreography specifically, well, you say, well, I do this, this thing. Don't worry. Don't worry that somebody else already does it. There's no, nobody can make you feel foolish here. I mean, if you say, hey, I do square through two hands instead of square through four, because that's more interesting, say that. That's, that's more interesting because somebody else might not have thought of that. So don't worry that whatever you're thinking of is not good enough, what I'm trying to say. Whatever you think of is good enough, and if you can get it on the tape here, it goes out to everybody, and somebody out there is going to benefit from that. Somebody's going to benefit from your thought process, and that's the important thing we want to get out of this session. Is that okay? All right. So we do have some handouts here. I'm going to hand them out in a second, but I want to ask you a question. When we say different but not destructive, what do we mean by destructive? Does anybody have any idea of what I'm saying by that? When I say when your calling is destructive, any thoughts on that? Any? Breaks down the squares, okay? So, so if you're calling in a way that's going to break down the squares, what are some of the ways you call that breaks down the squares? What are you doing when you're calling? How are you calling? Badly, okay. Huh? Timing. Okay, so you, maybe you're calling too fast, okay, right? You're calling too fast. Um, what's another way you can call calls that will guarantee to break down a square? Stack the calls. Okay, stacking calls. Out of position. Okay. How, huh? Being unclear, mumbling. Okay. How about calling something they don't know? Something off the list. Yeah. All right. Um, sorry? Yeah, when they get it murky and they feel wrong and they start correcting, yes. So there are a lot of ways you know as a caller how to call to be destructive, right? Well, you know, you know how to do that. It's pretty easy to do that. It's pretty easy to kill the dancers. I'm always surprised when um, the dancers in certain festivals and organizations want to do a competition and dancers really get, oh, yeah, we really want to get it so we make it hard. Well, it's pretty easy. Probably most callers in this room can call a tip, even the mainstream, that will kill the dancers, right? And yet they all want to do that for some reason. Um, so our, our job is to figure out the right balance of keeping them dancing and entertained right to the edge without killing them, right? So how do you do that? How do you do something to keep them 
interested and make something different, they would go, hey, that was kind of cool. I like that, whatever that was. And, you know, and if you're a caller, you're like, i got to write that one down. That was a good one. I often say it. I'll hear some caller doing something. That's a good one. Write that down you know, because it's good. It's always good to steal somebody else's ideas. Um, so how about this? Using, here's another way to kill the dancers. Using an unaccepted interpretation of a call. Do you understand what I'm saying by that? Here's the call. The call is X. It's done this way. But this caller says, well, I think it should be done this way. And they call the call this way, expecting the dancers to do it the way this caller thinks it's done. I have a great example of that. And I did not actually look this up to see if it's legal. And I just, either either it's not legal or it's very great if it's legal. Can I get four dancers standing up here for a second? Just any four. It doesn't matter. It's four dancers facing in a box of four. It just, this, will be a, this will be a 30 second demo. Okay, that's, that's five. Okay, face, get closer, okay? All right, do a touch a quarter, okay? Obviously, if I said walk and dodge, you would know what to do, right? Good, leaders turn back. All right, so if I said walk and dodge from here, would you know what to do? Would you? Really? Go ahead, walk and dodge. Okay, so stop. Would that be a gray interpretation of walk and dodge? I saw a caller spend like an hour in a DVD workshop at uh, Nationals last year teaching everybody how to do a walk and dodge from here as a, as a pass-through, basically. Right, go ahead, go ahead and pass-through. This was his interpretation. And then, of course, if you walk and dodge from here, everybody would do what? A half sachet. That's his interpretation. Do a half sachet. Talking about. Okay. So that was his interpretation of walk and dodge. Does anybody kind of see how he could kind of get that fuzziness in there? In it to be a, okay. Thank you, guys. You can sit down. Thank you very much. Clap. Hey. Okay. That would be what I would call a gray interpretation of a call. I mean, is it legal or not? You could probably spend hours discussing if that was legal. Is it worth it? I don't know. How many other ways could you have done walk and dodge that would have no question about how to do about the interpretation of the call? We did it from a right hand box there. What if you did it from a left hand box? What if you did it with the girls looking in, the boys looking out? Those are at least two other ways of doing the call where there's no question about the interp- you know, it's legal to do the call that way, right? We've got to figure out where that's coming from. I don't know if there's a way to change it. If I turn that off and switch to a wired mic, I can do that for now anyway. Uh, except the people have to walk up here to use the wired mic. We can do that. The tapes are attached to the wireless? Okay, lay the antennas down flat. Okay. Just lay flat. That's fine. We don't need my. There you go. All right, so, so that's an example. I, I, I use the example walk and dodge because obviously the most common use of walk and dodge is from a standard facing box, touch a quarter, walk and dodge, and the boys walking, the girls dodging. All right? Everybody knows that. Flip it around where the girls are looking in, the boys are looking out, a little more difficult. All right. Flip it around to a left-hand box, more difficult. Flip it around to facing lines past the ocean, then walk and dodge, a whole lot more difficult, right? Right? Because people aren't associating themselves with their box of four. They're lined up with their wave. Their whole mindset's in the wave. It's not in the box of four. So there are a lot of ways of using walk and dodge that would have been different but not destructive in the sense that they're trying to figure out what does walk and dodge mean. It means, in this case, they're going to need some training. You can't just throw this on them. You're going to have to train them and say, well, we have to work on walk and dodge. And they'll get it. They'll get it. They'll, they'll pick up that, how to do it in a minute. But they're not going to sit there and figure out, how do I do walk and dodge from facing couples? I mean, does that really work? And look at the definition go through the whole thing. You know? That becomes a big discussion nobody really wants to have. So, so the idea here is to take the calls you already know and find ways of using them that are different than what we normally use them without really stretching them into something they were never meant to be. And that actually requires homework on your part. And when I say homework, it means printing and reading the definitions of the calls. There's been a lot of work that's been done on creating and maintaining the definitions of the calls. And they're not work in such a way that it's not work to throw on the website to forget about, to say it's a historical document. They're an active living document. And every time I go in there and I look up a call to see how it's done, even calls I think of annoying forever, like let's say, you know, square through four, and I look at that, okay, everybody knows square through four, but you look in the read the definition, you might find some little nuance about that call that you never thought of before. Say, hey, this is kind of interesting. I, I never thought about it that way. I could use a call this way. 
I don't want to spring it on my dancers because they're not going to know how to do it. I'll train them how to do it, and we can use a call that way. But it's already a call they know, square through, a little variation. There are other little nuances like calls, like, like, like calls that aren't used very much. Do pas so is an example. What's the ending formation of do pas so? If you don't know that off the top of your head right now, read the definition because it's very important how that comes up. Are you going to say something, Butch? I think it really helps because we've done it in a number of the caller schools. If you give a caller the call analysis sheet and you make them work out that call analysis sheet and you get these little nuances and you force yourself to work on that one sheet on that one call, and a lot of times you come up with things. And then if you got a group of guys for a local caller's meeting and have everybody do that sheet and see who wrote down something different, and you really can find some neat little things about some basic call that somebody does a different way. Exactly. It's worth doing that. Does anybody get uh, American Square Dance magazine? I get Square Dance. Okay. I, flip, I go through it pretty quickly, but I always go to the choreo section in the middle with Cotman, Cotman Choreo, and I read through that because he'll always have something he's doing, right? The, the two Cotmans will do something in the choreography. They're doing, they'll feature a call and they go through, okay, yeah, 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 do that. I never thought of that. And I'll find one or two gems in there going, hey, that's kind of interesting. I never thought about doing it that call that way in that combination. You know, some one of those sequences will pick up. And, that's really cool, and it, they don't break the call. They just, oh, I didn't think about putting the two together that way. That's that's kind of cool. And it, I could have thought of that if I sat around one day, but I just picked it up off there, off the off the magazine. So, it's important to look at choreography examples of other callers, um, call analysis sheets, and see what other callers. And you can look through them pretty quickly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, there's one. Like everything in life, even this convention as a whole, for two days, you may only get two or three gems out of this whole convention, but it's worth it for those two or three gems, right? Like everything in life, it's worth it for those one or two or three gems. You pull out of that and say, I can take away that and, and work with that, okay? So the same thing goes with the calls. If you look at the program you have, the program you're working with, look through the nuances of how that call is described and defined, and, and I almost hate this word now, the gestalt of the call, which is what it was intended to be, right? And it's how you can work with that call without breaking how that call is supposed to be, and then work with your dancers to have them understand that call a little deeper. Now you can go into something that's a little, a little different than what you've been doing, but not killing them. There's a lot of talk about the basic program, the two basic programs, and the mainstream program, and about how we can make it more interesting, and that a lot of callers call through the mainstream program and feel they really can't call anything interesting until they get to plus. I don't know if that's true for you in this room, but I know for myself, I was that way for many, many years. I thought, well, it doesn't really get fun until it gets to be plus, right? That's, that's how I felt. I don't feel that way anymore. I feel it's far, far more material mainstream than I ever thought possible. If I really dig deep into this cause and look around at what can be done, look back into how choreography had used to work before today. I'm going to guess by looking around the room that most of you have been calling, except for you, Butch, uh, 25 years or less. Is that probably right? Two, less than 25 years? Okay, except for Butch. Okay, so, so for the most part, if you look back on the way choreography was done in the 60s and 70s, look back to old publications, um, and the calls that were written and the sequences written there, they use, for the large part, they use the same calls we use today. There's a few calls that are, that are gone. But look at how they dance them. We cannot dance. The dancers today can't or don't dance those calls the way they were done back then. They just don't. And it's really fascinating to read some of those calls. They only had... 60, 50, 60 calls back then. They didn't have that many calls. You can find stuff like that in old issues of Sets and Order magazine. You can buy them right out front there for $20. <laughs> All, the All the issues. Going back to 1949. They're at the Ways and Means table. Ways and Means table. And this 20, is not, 20 bucks. This is not a pitch to sell that, but I'm just saying it's, just, it's, it's great. It's a digitized version of it. It's got great choreography going way back. Yeah, Tom. Tom's, Tom Sounder from Maryland. I've been dancing since uh, 1962, and the difference really then was that we had only 18 calls. So then we would dance them mo much better in time than we do now. So now the dancers have so much things, and, it, and they don't dance as well. They don't dance them as well. So that it flowed differently, and we had a lot of calls that didn't have endings like we think today, like pass through, separate, round one, keeps going. 
Cross Trail through really didn't have an ending, but people thought it should. But it really kept going, too, until you got to the place that you were directed to go. So we had a lot of that flowing stuff where, in fact, if the caller made us stand as a teenager, we hated it. We didn't like to stand there. We liked to keep moving. And our choreography now has a lot of that stop-and-go thing that we don't have now. And that is a big reason why our choreography is so different now. Thank you. Rich. I've got uh, – can I have two couples come up here? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Butch Adams from Washington, D.C. area. Um, can I have two couples up here? I want to ask you a question about verbiage, not so much about the move, but about verbiage, what your opinions are. You know, two couples, any two couples? And touch a quarter. And the boys face in to the right and face the girl's side. If I have a setup like this, and I tell everybody using the term, I want them to do an individual walk and dodge, but the individual term would be do your part. And yet that's not in the mainstream program. That's a higher level. But I'm seeing that that's being used so much more now at the lower levels just to add a little bit of spice. So if I told everybody here, think about it, do your part of walk and dodge. Okay. Okay. And everybody, I put you in the wrong position, actually. Everybody face in and do a right and left through. <laughs> well, it doesn't make any difference. I just need four people facing. It really doesn't make any difference, okay? All right, pass the ocean. Hinge your quarter. Okay, girls turn to the right and face the gentleman's side. Okay, if I told everybody here, do your part of walk and dodge, my question is not that the dancers, usually even the mainstream, will, in the way you approach it, will do it. My question is the verbiage that is used when you say, do your part. Because that's nowhere within that I see written in the mainstream. So if I said, everybody, do your part of walk and dodge, what would you do? Everybody has to walk straight ahead, right? So do your part of walk and dodge. And you're done. And my question is not that the dancers won't do it, because most dancers will. My question is, how do you call it? That's a good question. Th thank you, dancers. You can sit down. Thank you. Hey. Um, do your part of a call when the call the formation isn't there. So the formation wasn't fully there for a box. So everybody had to do their part of the call in the box. That's parts in the preface for the C1 definitions. So in C1, you're expected to do your part of a call even when the formation isn't there. It's not part of the mainstream definitions that I'm aware of. The callers, the dancers are not expected to do their part of a call if the formation's not there. Not that I'm aware of, okay? So uh, that doesn't mean you couldn't work that with your groups. I mean, sure, you could train your groups to do that. I would not ever expect a group to know that. So, um, so in that formation, you had a T-bone set up, and T-bones T -bones as a formation is clearly a C1 formation, right? So you had T-bone set up there. Would you want to work? Could you work that strip, workshop that with your own club? Sure, you could do that, whatever. But I wouldn't I wouldn't address that as something as part of a regular program unless it was my own private dancers I was calling to for some reason, you know, like that. But but if I went, came out and did a dance for a group of people and I wanted to do walk and dodge. I'm not sure I would do that because that would kind of stretch beyond what we say at mainstream that they're supposed to understand as formations because they have to understand a formation that's not there. It's okay? That's what I'm thinking. That's how I look at that. I give a hand. Did you get a hand out? Did everybody get a hand out here? Who, who didn't get a hand out? Do we, are there extra? Do we run out of handouts? Okay, so we have um, the one-page sheet here. Barry's is more pages because um, he's better than I am. Um, <laughs> he's retired, yeah. I still have a job. So mine says different but not destructive, or different not destructive. And we talked about the first things at the top here, calling too fast, calling calls off the list, using unaccepted, unaccepted interpretations of the call. We all have an idea what standard formations are and standard positioning. We, we know that intrinsically from the way we were taught and the way we've taught class and the way we see dancers dance. 
We also know what standard is based on the books and the, and the, and the publications from Caller Lab, the standard applications of calls. We already know what those are. Okay. We know what the modules are. A lot of us have modules. Even if we're not a module caller, we have modules in our heads. We know what modules are. We know certain modules that go together automatically. We have standard singing call figures that we've been using for years, the ones that come up on every record. There's standard ones that we've seen a million times. We can do them in our sleep. And we always know that some calls always follow other calls. I started calling for a group 25, 30 years ago, um, and, I, and I came to this club, and I don't know, I did swing through, boys run, couple circulate. And even before, I could, as I moved up on the couple circulate, before I could say the next word, they were doing bend the line because that's what they always did after a couple of circuits, they bend the line. And I couldn't figure that out. I said, well, I didn't call bend the line. They just did it, right? And so then I did it again. They did it again. So then I called, well, no, I called wheel and deal. And of course, they broke down or whatever. You know, or then I did cast off three quarters, something different. And they say, no, after a couple of circuits, we just bend the line. They were so thrown that after you do a swing through, boys run, couple of circuits, they bend the line. That's what you always do. And that's the way they've always been taught. So I had to re- train them, not in a different call, but in a different way of sequencing the calls together. So we looked at that. We looked at saying, then it made me think, okay, great, couple circuit now, besides bend the line and wheel and deal, what else could I do? And I thought of a lot of other things, and we kept working through that process in my head. What can you do that's not going to be awkward, that's not going to make them stand around, that's not going to be, you know, questionable or, or something that is gray, but what else could we done? And, and again, look back to the old publications. They've got some great ideas, stuff that we used to do all the time a long time ago, but we don't do them anymore. Um, so I put down here some ideas of what is different but not destructive. The first one I said was any call switch to left-handed. I kind of look at the whole world. I think we're kind of a right-handed world. I think 10% of the, of, the, of the world is left-handed, right? Is that correct? By statistics. So 90% of us are right-handed. I'm right-handed. So we kind of, we, we create a whole world as a right-hand world. We do everything right-handed. And so I kind of wonder how left-hand people feel about that. I don't know. Huh? They're left out? <laughs> so there you go. So I thought, well, you know what? If you just take any call and switch to left-handed, it's theoretically going to be just as smooth as a right-hand version if you just switch everything, kind of like looking in the mirror, right? It should be the same thing, but the other way around in most cases, right? So if you think about it, head square through four, right, swing through, boys run, Ferris wheel, star through in the middle, back out your home, right? Heads left square through four, left swing through, are you with me? Girls run, Ferris wheel, center star through, back out your home. It would be hard to argue that wasn't pretty much as smooth as the first sequence, but it's completely left-handed. Yes? I'll come, to the, come to the microphone. No, come to the microphone. Hi, it's uh, Chris Stacy, and I'm from the D.C. area. Um, about doing left-handed things, I was going to say, I had the unfortunate experience one time of, uh, well, I, I had sort of grown up calling for a, a high-powered uh, youth group that they would do anything to call. So one of my first times out at a real square dance club, uh, and the, the, the kids from, the, uh, from, the, from my club came out there to support me. And so I'm, I'm up there calling, and I called a left square through, and uh, at, at, the, uh, at the little after party we had, uh, one of the one of the people from the group came up and said, "You know, you called that left square through back there, and and we were in a square with like the old people, right to them, and um, <coughs> and uh, and and I and I stuck out my left hand and I tried to, and the lady over there, this little old lady, looked at me and she says, oh no, dear, we don't do lefts.' <laughs> so I mean, <laughs> pitfall of uh, trying to call left stuff." And you do get that. You're going to find people who say, well, I've never done it that way. I've done 30 years of done it with a right hand. They may not be your audience for doing left hand. If they've been doing it 30 years right hand, they may, they, they, maybe that's all they want. So maybe they're not your audience. So I'm just, you got to know your audience and what people want out there, what you're going to be able to be successful at doing. So you have a left hand for a left square through, great. Left swing through, anything left handed. You can put left in front of so many calls on the mainstream program, and it completely, it's like adding a whole new call. But it's not adding a whole new call. It's the same call. It's just switched around the other way. So really think about that. And don't mean that, in, and, and you've got to be very careful because if people are not used to doing left-hand calls, you're going to kill them. You will kill them. You need to be able to train them. You're saying it's a call you already know. We're going to be doing a left-hander from this point. Okay? Using a call from a different starting formation but keeping the same flow. Okay? We often, here's a singing call figure, swing through, spin the top, right and left through. We all call that, right? 
that right and left through is from an ocean wave, but it works well because we flow, we move up to it, and, we, and you can lead dancers right into it. If you had parallel waves with the boys on the end, right-hand waves, and you said all eight circulate right and left through, what's your success rate? Any idea? 60% success rate? Zero? How about this? Facing lines, past the ocean, square through three. What's your success rate? Or zero. What could your success rate be if your dancers were trained? They could be 100 pretty quickly, right? Once you get them to recognize how those kind of calls work from a wave, and, and again, it's not, it's not awkward if you think about it for a second. If I say pass the ocean, all eight circulate square through three, the first time you dance, no question, the dancers will break down. Well, my dancers would break down, okay? Maybe your dancers wouldn't. But if I train them how to do that, they'd get it, and it would flow. And you can, okay, all eight circulate square through three, and they can move on to a trade buy or whatever. So I kept the same flow. The flow is there, and probably if you dig back 40 years, it's probably some sequence written down, some choreography that has that as a part of the regular choreography. We just don't use that anymore. So how can you put the calls together in a way that keeps the flow moving, but it's a little bit different, but it's the same call they already know? Here's one of my favorites, revitalizing lesser-used calls. Everyone has the calls they have that are favorite and calls they never use, and I'm just as guilty as anyone else, and you are too. There's calls you don't ever use. I'll bet one of them is Do Paso, all right? How many of you can use Do Paso on a regular basis? On a regular basis? I don't believe you. All right. I use Do Paso occasionally. How many of you use Wheel Around on a regular basis from anything other than a promenade? From anything other than a promenade, okay? So for you guys, I am preaching to the choir. So couples circulate from a left-hand two-faced line, boys in the middle, couples circulate, lead couple wheel around, Okay? You have lines facing in. Callers he or dancers hear wheel and deal, so they'll do a wheel and deal, or they can't figure out who the lead couple is. And that steps back a whole different discussion, who are the leaders. When I had the box up here for walk and dodge, I said leaders turn back, there was a pause. Right? What did I mean by leaders turn back? All right, so we, there's a discussion there about who the leaders are, who the trailers are. So you can have that in there. There are a lot of lesser-used calls. The lesser-used calls are for you. What are your lesser-used calls? Okay? I know what my lesser use. I've got a half a dozen calls I don't use very much. What do I do? I try to use those calls because I try, to, I try to use the entire program. Everyone has calls they don't use very much. And everybody knows there are certain calls that as a whole we don't use very much. When you go to a dance out there, there are calls you know are not going to be called much. You're not going to hear spin chain through with the ends just sitting there. All right, you'll hear spin chain through with the ends circulate twice. But try to call spin chain through with the ends just standing there. They will try to do that spin chain the gears every time. You're not going to hear pass to the center that much in most areas. You hear pass through tray by, you'll hear dive through, but you don't hear pass to the center that much. If you really hear it a lot in your area, I'd like to know about that. But that's a lesser used call. So look at the calls that are lesser used and see how you can exploit those calls in a good way because they're on the program. You had to teach your dancers at some point how to do those calls. Creative and directional uses of basic calls. So Butch can probably speak better to this than I can because he has a lot more history on this. But if you think about some of the old-time routines, such as Venus and Mars. Does anybody know what Venus and Mars is? Does anybody not know what Venus and Mars is? Okay, it's an old-time routine. I, I'm gonna, not going to get into it in a lot of detail here, but think of a star promenade, right? The girls are going to peel off or spin out one way, the boys keeping the left-hand star, and they'll form a right-hand star over here as the boys keep the left-hand star. And you make two stars, one like Venus, one like Mars. There's a whole pattern routine that goes with this thing. they got two stars, kind of like cogs spinning, and then they come back together, and the girls come back with the boys, and they hook back together like gears. It's a very cool routine. It's an old-time routine, and it's very directional. You have to walk your dancers through it to understand it the first time, but it's a directional use of calls. You're not teaching them a new call. You're showing them a pattern with stars and arm turns, um, and mostly stars in that case. That one's just stars. But there's a lot of ways to take existing calls and just use them directionally, especially with arm turns and stars, and see how you can do this. Buddy Weaver is a master. you gotta, you got to talk to Buddy. Buddy Weaver is a master at doing a party night, a one-night stand, with six calls all night long. Even I can't do that. I probably teach ten calls. But he'll do stuff with stars that just keeps going on, different ways of using stars. I think, wow, that's really amazing. I never thought about using stars that many different ways. Does that mean you can make that your entire program for your mainstream club? Probably not. 
But adding a little bit of spice with those stars might not be a bad idea, especially if you do a little research about how that star might end up after you turn it three quarters and do something else with it. Finally, changing the usual sequencing. Okay. Changing the usual sequencing of calls. This is the biggest thing. We always know that head square through four is followed by what? Do, so, do, make a wave, swing through, boys run, bend the line. Right? That's what we always have to call. Right? 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 But that's, that's the way we always hear it. That's the way people hear it out there. If you don't do it that way, great. But that's what I hear out there in the world. You hear that from everybody. When you change the sequencing of the calls, you're saying, I can put the calls together in a different way. The existing calls, no different than what you're already doing, but in a different way. Try this sequence. Head, spin the top, sides, half, sashay, everybody extend. How successful are your dancers going to be with that? Zero? Anybody think they might have success with their dancers? What's different about that? Hmm? You got to spin the top from facing couples. You got to spin the top from a squared set. You got the sides doing a half sashay. How many people will do a roll away instead of a half sashay? A lot of people, right? Because they don't know what half sashay is. Um, you got all these things. You got now. You got half sashay setups. You got to extend. The boys are going to be in the middle. They're going to feel funny about that. But none of that was wrong. It all works. It's just not a sequence that most people call. It's not a, not a normal sequence that people you would hear often. But it's a way of putting the calls together in a different sequence, and yet flows together in the already existing calls. Anytime you can take those calls that you already know off the program and pull them out and say, hey, I know we always say touch a chord, then call them circulate. Hmm, great. What else could you do instead of that, right? There's a lot of things you could do. Do you want, you want to add something to that one? Okay, here's Butch again. You also have to know your dancers in the way they hold their hands when they dance because the styling of the dancers in different areas of the country are different. If you're going to do a pass the ocean and do a right and left through, if you're trying to call that to a group of people that are used to having hands up on an ocean wave, you're not going to have the success. If you have the arms, you may have success, but if they're doing hands down dancing, you will have success. So you've got to teach your dancers how you do things and have them do the old call rare back where they change their handhold to shake a hand. It's not that they don't know how to do the move. They don't see the position that you're calling it from. Uh, so you got to be careful who you're calling to and know what your group is physically doing before you ever call the move. Absolutely. Know your dancers, know how they dance, and the style of dancing they have. Anyway, my time is almost up here. I just want to pull in a conclusion here. I gave you some examples, just a quick couple of examples down here. That's just a seed. I'm just These were some ideas I threw down really quickly. There's a seed. Think, think, think. Get your checkers out. And I really do mean your checkers, not contaminations and not... CSDS or SD. Get your checkers out and put them together in different combinations. Use the internet to research ideas. There's some great material out there, great material out there, and there is no law against stealing material that's already out there. It's, it's research. It's research, right? Plagiarize, plagiarize, let nothing evade your eyes. Um, and especially if you know a good caller is coming to town that calls interesting choreography that's not strange or weird or gray or something bizarre, but really good, interesting choreography, go to that caller's dance. Go to that caller's dance. Take notes. Talk to the caller. Find out what's going on. Think about how you can bring that back to your club and train your dancers to do a wider variety of calls that they already know. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to Barry Klasberg. He'll take it from here. Thanks, Eric. Good job. So... I'm going to come at this from a little bit of a different direction. Um, a lot of what Eric has said is, is also in, included in, in my presentation. I think you all have my handout now. If you don't, uh, I still have a few extra copies. Um, don't think you're going to read the handout along with my talk. The handout is for something for you to read later when you don't remember what I said. Um, I did a presentation last year called Great Expectations. How many of you... Was it, were any of you in that, that room? Um, this is kind of a follow-on uh, to that. Uh, so I'm going to give you a two-minute synopsis of my one-hour presentation from, from last year uh, to kind of put a different framework about the way you look at some of this, this choreography. Um, the presentation last year dealt with the way that our brains basically process 
uh, information. Uh, there, there's been a couple of books in, in, on the bestseller lists in, in the recent past. Uh, one was a book called Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, which was the major source that I drew my information from last year. There's also the book Blink by uh, Malcolm Gladwell, and you can find them in any bookstore these days. Um, and both of them dealt with the phenomenon that we see where sometimes things just pop into our heads. An answer just pops into your head. You look at a situation that may actually be very complicated, and the answer just pops into your head. And that's fast thinking in the terminology of Daniel Kahneman. And his whole book deals with how does that happen? Because often these situations are very complicated. Uh, you can take the example of, say, a, a chess master who's playing 10 games at once. You've probably seen documentaries where they do that kind of thing. Um, and there, there's 10 guys lined up with chess boards, and there's the chess master walking up and down the line, and he just looks at the board, and he goes bang, and he goes to the next one, and he looks at the board. How is he doing that? He's able to do that because he's got so many hours of experience playing chess that he can just look at the board, and the situation on that board just pops into his, his mind. He knows where the strengths and weaknesses of the two sides are. He knows what moves are going to further his position. And he just knows it like that, especially when he's playing somebody that doesn't know near as much as he does. So this just pops into his head. How does that happen? We have kind of a super pattern matching engine in our minds. It's a part of the brain that is constantly man, uh, um, monitoring the world around us and giving us information about what we should do, information about what might come next based on what we've just seen, information about what this thing we're looking at means. If it's a problem, it may pop the solution into our minds because we've seen this all before. And this all happens literally in a blink in Malcolm Gladwell's terminology. When people are square dancing, that's the part of the brain that they're using. When people dance, it's really the actual dancing part where you get them up and you start calling to the music and they start moving and they're hearing all these calls. That's all being done by this what we call system one in the brain, this instant thinking part of the brain, which is basically just pattern matching what's going on around me right this instant and deciding instantly what to do. Now, the way that pattern matching is done is our experiences build mental models in our minds of situations that we've seen before. If we get a match on whatever's happening around us, if that makes a pattern that we recognize, we pop that mental model out as the, as the answer to that situation. So if you imagine a dancer who's he's at a dance, He's hearing calls. What's going on as he hears those calls? He hears the call. He knows the position he's in. He knows what's just happened. He knows what program he's dancing. He knows the caller that he's dancing to and what the caller's done in the immediate past. So he's starting to learn the habits of that caller. Um, all of that is, is information that goes into this pattern matching process. And they hear the call, and they that hopefully pops out something, a mental model, that says, here's what I do as a result of hearing that call in this situation. And when it's a very familiar situation and that mental model is exactly accurate, the dancer is dancing smoothly. So when you hear the, you know, the typical stuff that the dancers are used to hearing, you know, head square through four, touch the quarter, scoot back, boys go in, boys run around the girls, pass through, wheel and deal. I mean, how many times have you heard that stuff? You all followed that in your head, I bet you. The, the, and the dancers do too. All of that is familiar, familiar, familiar. They will dance that on what you might think of as autopilot. Each time they hear the call, they're in a very familiar situation. They know exactly what to do. So when you're doing choreography like that, that's, quote, easy, right? It's easy because it's familiar. They, they know exactly what to do as a result of the mental processing that they're doing. That mental processing is based on this mental model that I talked about. Where does the mental model come from? 
The metal model is based on two things. First, it's based on the initial teaching experience that the dancer had about that, that call. It is not based on the definition of the call, the way it's written in our definition books. How many dancers do you know who have actually read a definition? At, at mainstream and plus, I mean, they're very rare. Even at challenge, you can talk to lots of dancers who have never actually read the written words of the definition. What happens is somebody teaches them the call on the floor. They describe it in words. They may, you know, demonstrate it. They give them an initial experience of what that call is, and the dancer absorbs that. And then each time the dancer encounters the call again, whether it's from that caller or some other caller, they start adding information to that mental model. So maybe the caller was, let's say the caller taught scoot back as head square through four, touch a quarter, right? How many of you have done that yourselves, right? That's the setup to teach scoot back. And then you teach this, the scoot back thing. So you're thinking to yourself, well, the dancer now knows the rule for scoot back. If, if you've taught it anything like the definition, you talked about the people looking in and the people looking out as being the roles that they needed to worry about and that it's done in this group of four. But even if you said all those words, the dancers absorbed a bunch of information that you didn't intend to give them, especially if you use that setup more than a couple of times. They'll absorb the information that it's done from waves, that it's right-handed, that the boys always go in. They'll absorb all of that without you telling them. And then you get this stuff that Patty was talking about the other day, where if you set up the scoot back so that the girls have to go in, they have no idea what to do. Because in their mind, you gave them the information that it was the, the call had a boy's part and a girl's part, not a leader's part and a trailer's part. And you gave them the information that it's done from waves. So if they get it, if you instead say heads touch a quarter, heads scoot back, they don't know what to do because there's no wave there. How am I supposed to scoot back when there's no wave? They didn't absorb the information that it's a box of four call, even if you told them that it's a box of four call. That those words may have, might have come through, but if the only experience they get with the call is from this wave situation, then the, in their minds, it's a wave call. If they hear it from somewhere else, they don't know what to do with it. So these mental models are, are built in this way. Now, the, the remarks I'm going to make now are done in the context of you're a caller who's calling to dancers that don't dance to you all the time. So you're filling in for somebody else's club while they're on vacation or you're calling at a, a convention or a festival or something. You've got people in front of you. You don't know who they are. And how do you find out what mental models the dancers have in front of you? Because that's what we need to do as callers. The only way you can call a smooth dance is to find out what those dancers think the calls are. We know that they're you know, they don't have the written definition in their head. We can't rely on that. You have to suss out the floor. How many of you went to one of the sessions that we've had for the last three years called sussing the floor? So there we talked about techniques for the caller to, to sort of throw things out there, see how the dancers react, and then use that information to figure out what the shape of their mental model is. Now, every floor is going to have sort of a different state. In fact, they may have a different state from tip to tip, depending on who gets up on the floor, who's gotten tired, whose medication just kicked in. You know, all of that stuff can change the way the dancers behave, and that changes the way they process things through their mental models. So you have to be watching this kind of thing all the time. And in fact, the way they dance will change throughout the dance, hopefully for the better, but not always. So if we look at this, this mental model idea, and we look at it from the point of view of the dancer is hearing a call, processing it through their mental model, whatever it is for the call, which is something that is probably unique to them because they've had unique experiences. They had a you know, particular teaching experience, then they had some unique experiences, and that's what they've built into the call. What levels of difficulty do you get 
from that because the caller needs to figure out what level of difficulty or what constitutes what level of difficulty for that call, for that dancer. So the first level of difficulty is I know this in my sleep. If I hear nothing but this kind of stuff, I'm probably going to get bored. Even though we say the dancers don't get bored, the callers are the ones that get bored, that's not entirely true. We get bored before they do, admittedly. But the fact is that if you're a modern Western square dancer, one of the things that you're looking for is a little variety. Because if you think about what's different from our activity to things like contras and traditional squares, the difference is that dancers don't know what's coming. So the fact that they're on a modern Western square dance floor means they've self-selected themselves for variety. They get a kick out of variety and stuff that's different. But everything can't be different. If everything was different, they'd be standing there solving problems for, for every call. So we have to create this mix of stuff that they can just do in their sleep. Their mental models just keep kicking the right answer out. And then every once in a while, you've got to give them something that's a little bit different. So the first level of difficulty is what you might call vanilla. I can do this in my sleep. Everybody knows how to do this. Then the next level of difficulty is it's a little bit different. So that might be something as simple as, depending on the floor that you're, you're dealing with, how many people would start a sequence with something like heads square through three instead of four? You ever tried that? Sometimes you try that and they do it. And other times you get a random mess on the floor. You get some people that square through four. You get some people that pass through because they really don't know what a square through three is from there. Uh, even though it's, you know, a perfectly normal call that theoretically they should know. If they were in an eight chain and you said square through three, they'd know exactly what to do. So that's something that you can throw out as a test. That's one of these sussing tests that you can throw out. So that might be something that's a little bit different for one floor, and it would just be vanilla for another floor. So you would have to test them and figure out what the difference is. Then there's the different, it's different, but it's doable. So what happens is the dancer hears the call, they process it through their mental model, and the answer comes back, it sounds familiar, but I'm not exactly sure how it works from here. And they have to do a little bit of thinking. It's not an automatic reaction. And then, but their, their understanding of the call allows them to solve the problem. So it might be something like, from an eight chain, how many people have ever done centers in from an eight chain? So that's the kind of thing, if you call that, you'll get this hesitation on the floor, like, mm, what's, what's that? And then they'll do it wrong, and you tell them where they should really be. But, but it's something that a lot of people can figure out how to do, even if they haven't seen it before. And you you're right, you'll usually get random results that you then have to work with. But that's why can't you do centers in from an eight chain? I mean, there's nothing in the definition that says you can't do that. There's nothing in the way we teach the call that says you can't do that. It's just we never do it. So that might be something that's different but doable for, for some dancers. Then we've got different but destructive, level one. So different but destructive level one is the dancers executing the call, like their mental model process that is, here's what I do, and they start working their way through the call and it just doesn't feel right. Maybe because it was left-handed when they started or they're just not in a familiar position or they didn't realize that they were in an unfamiliar position. Things just start to feel wrong. Here's an example. I just, before I came here, I called a dance at uh, one of our local clubs. It's a basic club. Um, I called heads pass through, separate, go around two. How many of you do that? You know, so that's a little bit different. It's not called every day, but most dancers have at least seen it. Make a line of four. So now they're sashayed lines, right? I called a pass through, and they fixed it. <laughs> I got a cross trail out of them. So now I knew I'm dealing with dancers that are very unfamiliar with the idea of doing things from a sashayed setup. 
I knew right away that even if I, if I get them to do the pass through, a bend the line ain't going to fly. So that's an example of something that was, for that floor, was destructive because the dancers felt that something was wrong. They sort of did the call, but it sure didn't turn out the way I expect, so I got to fix it. So that's the first level of destruction. The second level is something that the dancer just does not know at all. Their mental model just does not cope with whatever you did to them. So they stop dancing, and that's the ultimate definition of destruction. Um, another definition, or, or another case of, of destruction that you it's even worse than they don't know what to do, is that they think they know what to do, but it's wrong. So they do something they have a lot of confidence in, and they're wrong. And if you do that to them very much, then you get labeled as being dirty color, right? You're tricky. You're trying to fool me. Uh, you're not on my side. You don't want to go there. Um, but at least not intentionally, you don't want to go there. So those are kind of the, the levels of difficulty that you're trying to manage. And part of, of calling something that's different is understanding what this floor can handle, what they think is different. It may actually be pretty vanilla stuff to some other group, but you got to be able to gauge that. But before you can call something different, you have to have thought up some things that are generically different. And Eric went through some of the approaches for, for doing that. One of the things that I've always criticized about these kind of things in the past, these, these kind of panels, was that people would get up and they just give you like, here's 85 things that are different. But they didn't kind of give you a way to think about how to create something like that for yourself. So Eric's mentioned a couple. One is just frankly go and read note services and stuff. Uh, Lee back there still writes uh, choreography sections for the uh, American Square Dance. It's an American Square Dance. You publish that stuff, right? You're still thinking about the H A through? <laughs> so there are note services and, and published places where you can find choreography, but if you do that, my caution to you is make sure you understand it. Don't just think you're going to, you know, take some choreography and read it to your dancers. You better understand how it works and why it works because if it blows their mental model, then you've got to understand how to deal with that, how to, how to fix it. One of the nice things about mental models is that you can change them on the fly. You can do things that expand the dancer's understanding of the call without necessarily workshopping, just by the way that you start to work, work the call with them. Um, so that's another uh, thing that you've got to be aware that you can do. But let me just talk about what I think of as kind of the generic approaches to finding inspiration for, for doing things that are different. The first thing is what not to do. Do not go to the written definition and read it like a barrack room lawyer looking for loopholes so that you can dazzle the dancers with, with, your, uh, with your academic brilliance. They don't care. You've got to work with what they have in their heads. So you have to go through this exercise of sussing the floor, figuring out what their mental models look like, so that you can work with what their understanding of the call is and give them something that their understanding considers a little, to be a little different, but something that they understand how they can cope with it. Another thing to avoid is, uh, Eric mentioned uh, left-handed stuff. If you're in this context of you're calling for somebody else's club, they're not your dancers, you're not going to train them that night in something that, that is really different or takes a lot of workshopping to get them through. Left-handed stuff can really be difficult because it goes against a lot of the muscle memory that people have built up. Their mental models say it feels like this. When it's left-handed, it feels totally different. And that's enough to just destroy some dancers. You can't get around that without a lot of physical training basically. I had this experience trying to teach uh, my, my plus group to do a left-handed recycle and I just abandoned it after a while because the, the, a lot of the people who were on the floor had danced plus for years and they just could not get their heads around the idea of how that felt and I'm having to go back and basically 
work the call over and over again, not left-handed, but get them understanding what the call really is. And there's a lot of stuff that just feels different. So if you're in a, you know, not a one-night stand necessarily, but you're, they're not dancers that you get to work with all the time, then stay away from that, that kind of thing. There's some things that just feel so different they're never going to get there. Something that you can do is look for the common combinations. Um, head star through. Everybody with me? Double pass through. Put centers in. What comes next? The question you ask yourself is, everybody knows what comes next. The dancers know what comes next. So find something else to come next. Now, there's a problem with this, I, and this is one that I play with a lot. This is one of my sussing the floor things, actually. So instead of saying cast off three quarters, I don't say anything. Double pass through, put centers in. Yep, and then you watch a bunch of the floor cast off three quarters, and then I say, those of you who haven't already cast off three quarters. But that's cued the floor that, oh, he's going to do weird stuff. And what that does is that takes their mental model into a different mode. Instead of just being on, on, on autopilot all the time, now the, uh, the supervisor is working up here. They're looking at the answers that the mental model brings back and saying, does this really apply? So then the next time you set up the double pass through, put centers in, pause slightly, and usually nobody moves. They Just one time is all you need to get it in their heads that something else may be coming. And then what can you do? Half, half tag, eh, I don't really like the way that flows. You know, because the ends went out, and now you're asking them to come back again. We do that kind of stuff with, but the question is, what could you do? Centers, centers California twirl is what I do a lot. And guess what happens the first time you do that? Everybody tries to California twirl, even though you've got same-sex couples sitting there. And watching the boys try and California twirl is a lot of fun. That's one of the reasons I keep doing it. It's really entertaining. <laughs> but after a while, you know, again, sometimes some floors are now they're tuned enough that they heard the word centers, and the centers did the California twirl. Um, but some floors should go through this, have to go through the next stage of, okay, I didn't say everybody California twirl, I said centers California twirl. What are you doing now? You're tuning their mental model to listen to more words to try and figure out what's going on. Because they know how to do a centers California twirl. I mean, that's not hard. But again, it's difficult. It's different. So now you got them in what? Inverted lines. Which brings me to the second thing to look for when you're trying to, fig trying to design choreography that's a little different. Find the things that you avoid because you don't know what to do with them. How many of you are really comfortable with an inverted line and have lots of choreography that you can, you can do out of that? A lot of callers do not know what to do with an inverted line. So sit down with the checkers, as Eric said, and figure out things that can be done from an inverted line without breaking the dancer's mental models. Now, what could you do? You could do a cast off three quarters. And I've actually done that. In fact, at C1, there's a really nice little combination you can do from that. If you know C1 calls, there's a call twist the line. And you can put centers in, California twirl, cast off three quarters, twist the line just a beautiful little piece of flow. And once I've got C1 dancers past casting off three quarters after the center's in, they'll do that little thing, just bang. You know, once you get them listening to you again. So you need to sit down and figure out what can I do from, from that situation. Ed? Mike, yeah. Where's the mic? Head foot Pittsburgh. Um, since we're dealing with mainstream, why don't you tell everybody how to call that directionally using mainstream calls only, but using that same combination? Call it directionally. Call the twist the line. 
Uh, yeah, you mean, but call that action that the twist the line represents. I've never actually tried that. Uh, what, what would I say? You could say center step forward and Put center, trade. Double pass through centers in, centers, California twirl, all cast off three quarters. New centers step forward and partner trade. The others face and star through. That's yeah. what you want. Yeah, you could you could say those words. Yeah. I'm not sure how well that, that makes, would work that on Main Street That lets you Florida. use what you use at C1 to be effective at Main Street. Exactly. I mean, I would I would feel a little nervous about presenting all those words unless I really worked them up to that. So I might do something that was one of the elements of twist the line, introduce that in a in a different format or a different uh, context first, and then lead them into it. Lee. Well, if you want to keep it at mainstream, you can have centers in, centers run, ends fold, centers in, then cast three. You got the same call with the centers in, cast three, and use all the combinations at mainstream. Yep. Let me say it again. Centers in, centers run, ends fold, centers in, cast three, and you got beautiful choreography. Everybody follow that? I'll say it again. Yeah. <laughs> centers in. Centers run. Are you using the centers? Yep. Ends fold, centers in, then you do your cast three. Yep. You know, there are two calls that should be on the mainstream list that I tell my dancers if there's going to be something unusual. Be careful and <laughs> listen carefully. Exactly. Where are we? We're pretty getting pretty close to the end. Um, so I've given you some of the generic stuff that I, uh, I look for. So... Look for common combinations and think up something different to do with that combination, because that gives you a lot of um, a lot of material to work with with the dancers. Like you can make an entire dance out of playing with with some of that stuff. Look for situations that you usually avoid, and try and figure out how you would handle them. There's a lot of situations that callers avoid just because they're not really sure what to do. Here's here's another kind of example of those two things together. Um, walk around your corner. What comes next? Squeeze. <laughs> How about walk around your corner, slide through? How do you think that would fly? Oh, it flows great. Walk around your corner, you're looking at your partner, right? And you're going to walk past your partner, and then you're going to face out. So if you called it as a slide through, it ain't going to fly. If you called it as a star through, they would probably do it. They would not be sure why, but they would do it. So now you've got a circle looking out. So it comes to the second point. What the hell can you do with a circle looking out? So you, could, you can circle left or circle right. <laughs> You could California twirl. And actually, I've done that combination. It works just fine. Walk around your corner, star through, California twirl. You're all looking back in. You can element left and whatever you want. But you could build them up to here's a sequence that you, you might want to just follow in your heads. If you can convince them what a slide through really is, which would take a lot of work, you couldn't just launch into it the way I'm presenting it here. Walk around your corner, slide through, join hands, circle left. So you're all looking out. You can make some joke about it. Now you can watch the other squares and see if they're screwing up. So they're all circling and they're looking out. Ladies out, the men sashay. Ladies out, the men sashay twice. So now everybody's got their opposite, right? Now California twirl, and they'll do it. Why will they do it? Because California twirl is defined as having the boy on the left and the girl on the right. They have always done it that way. They never get it from anywhere else, so they will automatically join the appropriate hands, California twirl. Four boys reverse flutter, pick up your partner, promenade home. How much preparation work do you think you would have to do to make that whole sequence fly? To get them there, you could probably take a tip or two, you know, working on the components of that. How many people ever use four boys flutter wheel? You know, yeah, Bob, I know you use all this stuff, but <laughs> we teach it, but then we never use it. How many of you use reverse flutter? That's reassuring. 
obviously the dancers that I call to just have callers that don't like it very much. But you'll find there's a lot of calls like how many people, um, if you call um, heads lead right, swing through, if you call right and left grand on a mainstream floor, what do you typically get? You get kind of a mess. You get a lot of, you know, some people will do it, but a lot, a lot won't. They're not used to seeing right and left grands from waves. And not only that, if you called a turn through, they wouldn't know what to do with that either. The first time I called mainstream at a convention, for some reason, just the way I train myself, I typically go to right and left grand get outs out of waves. That was that was the most predominant sort of get out that I had. The first time I did that to this mainstream group that I was calling to, they couldn't do it out of the wave and they couldn't do a turn through to get to an Alamant left. And I was like, oh my God, how do I resolve? I got to resolve to an Alamant left every time. Every get out was a Ferris wheel to square through three to Alamant left. That was all I had left. But I, I, you know, why don't we teach the dancers how to do it from from a wave? It's not hard. I mean, they're they're in no different place than if they did it from an eight chain. Oh, by the way, maybe they can't do it from a sashayed eight chain. Like, how do you get into a sashayed eight chain with a group that's going to cross trail through when you pass through from sashayed lines? So you have to. The message here is tune yourself to their mental model so that you know what they find to be different and then work at giving them something that's just a little bit beyond that, just a little bit more than they're used to, to dealing with. Help them through it and you'll find that you can, you can present choreography that keeps them dancing. You're not talking at them a lot. You're just kind of leading them gently along the way and you're presenting stuff that hasn't taken them down. You haven't had to lecture a lot, and they're not standing around listening to you talk. But they're dancing, and they're having a good time. The clock says it's noon. At least my watch says it's noon. Do we have any questions just before we, we break? Ed? You, you mentioned from an 18 through centers in that that would be a gray area, and you might be able to do it. So can you tell us how you would call that so that the dancers would be successful at mainstream? Are you calling that? I'd say put centers in and spread apart, center step in between them. And usually if you say those words and wait long enough, you, you get the right situation. Um, the, 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 what typically happens is you get a lot of people where the center spread apart and the ends step in. The, you know, the ends have this, this desire to step forward towards the center of the square. So you've got you've to gotta disabuse them of that. Uh, but, but if you cue it quickly, and give them time to scramble and, and get it right, then you wind up with the, the inverted The line. phrase I stole from Jerry Schatzer, top caller in New England 30 years ago, that always works, even for bad dancers. Centers squeeze in between the outsides and now do whatever you want. That always works because yeah. they know who the centers are, they know who the outsides are, and that always works. How, that brings up another one. How many of you use split two from there? Centers split the outsides. How many of you do uh, split the outsides from tandems in the middle? So imagine if you had squared up set, if you had the, the heads right and left through, veer to the left, tag the line, which would be a horrible flow. I wouldn't want to do that. But if you follow that, then you know what the setup is I'm talking about. Center split the outsides, first go left, the next go right around one to a line. I mean, it's it's stuff that we teach. You know, they they should have they should be able to do that, but... You, uh, that's another one that typical mainstream floor, you've got to nurse them through that. Okay, the time has elapsed. Uh, thank you all for your attention. And uh, I'm, just, I'm just trying to count the one, two, three, I got four. You've got, got to count? Got Great. To count. So when you I fill out your critique that. sheets, make sure you fill out your critique sheets and, and what you like and don't like about the sessions. And if you like this yeah. session, my name is Eric Henderloff. If you don't like it, his name is Barry Clasper. <laughs> yeah. And it can't emphasize enough that we read, the EC reads every single critique sheet. So if you have comments or suggestions, please put them in there. We really do pay attention. <laughs>